I think that there could be nobody more ready for this than I am. I've been there before. I know what the pressure's like. I know what my opponents are gonna throw at me. I know what my mind is gonna throw at me. And I really think that gives me an advantage because I just have experience in that specific arena. We're there to get each other and you'll see that. So you're gonna see that fire come out in this million pound Triton tournament and you're gonna see me give everything that I have to try to win this tournament. Before I walk in here, you know, I have to already be okay with if the bluff comes up, like I said, I need to be ready to go all in, even if that's level one, even if I get called and I'm out of this tournament in 20 minutes, which would be ridiculously disappointing. Looking at the lineup, I am currently the only female player. In terms of the competition itself, that's not going to matter at the table because this is not a gendered activity. What I'm just hoping for is to not let the side down. I'm prepared, I've done everything I can do, and the rest is out of my hands. It's just on me to execute, and I can do that. Professional poker players are always after the good games, and it doesn't get better than this with a 50-50 split of pros and non-pros. Although, for the first six levels, the pros and non-pros are separated. So, it has been quite the shark fest on the pro side of things. Indeed it has. Welcome back to our exclusive coverage of the Triton Million. Now in the old days, a rich non-professional was known as a whale in gambling circles. Yesterday was whale watching day, and today, as Marianella mentioned, it's time to see the sharks. And there is one of those sharks, Nick Petrangelo, and nothing sharkier than a couple of aces to get things kicked off here at the 2,000, 4,000 blind level. He opens to 9,500, and uh-oh. Sam Greenwood has queens, Daniel. Well, yeah, obviously this could be trouble. You know, you bring up a good point. We expect to see sort of a different brand of poker at the highest level when you have all the geniuses uh, up against each other. 95. High level poker, a little bit different than what we saw from the amateur or whatever you want to call it, non-pro table. Be interesting to see some of the plays we're gonna. Wow, look at this, re-raise out of position with the queens. And I do think that we have witnessed a lot of cautious play on the pro side of the bracket prior to the merger as they definitely want to allow themselves not to get busted before the field merges and they have an opportunity to play with these proverbial whales. Yeah, I mean, you would think so. You think to yourself, well, I mean, I just want to be in there for the next stage of the event, but these guys are going at it. Obviously, both have big hands. Here's Nick looking to get it in with the aces. Petrangelo has won just under 900,000 playing this year. It's the first year in which he hasn't eclipsed a million since 2014. So he's either playing a lot less or these aces aren't holding as often as they used to. <laughs> four bets to 160,000, the dilemma for Greenwood. And once the four bet comes in from Nikki P, Daniel, Sam is definitely going to be facing a very narrow range. Yeah, no question about it. And I think call is the right play as deep as they are. Uh, it's it's just you know to put in another 700,000 with queens without seeing a flop is a little bit uh, too aggressive I would say and this is a flop that's trouble for Greenwood no overcard to his queens if it came an ace or a king it'd be easier to get away but with two queens on this board he, if he called pre-flop he's got to continue after this flop and likely lose all his chips especially when facing the downsized 75,000 chip C bet. Now the six of clubs on the turn, the sort of board texture that doesn't rate to have connected with either of these holdings. And best case scenario for Greenwood here, Daniel, he's up against an ace king. 275,000. Well, obviously he's got him probably ranged somewhere in the neighborhood of aces, kings, or ace, king. And at this point, you know, if you've got two queens, you obviously beat 16 combinations versus, you know, just the uh, 12 of the aces and the, and the kings. The question for him now is, would he play ace-king this way, or would he check back the turn? Tough to get away. Wow! That's an impressive laydown there with two queens. I don't know that many players in the world could ever make such an impressive laydown. Really, really tough to get away from queens on that board. Well, Greenwood didn't get as far as he has in these circles without having that in his arsenal. On some level, people like to say that no matter the stakes, people are just playing poker. But I, at some point, people are aware that it's a million pounds. It is the biggest tournament of all time. And people aren't playing just their regular game. Maybe some amateurs feel like since their uh, net worth isn't really affected by losing a million, whereas a lot of the pros, it's a substantial amount of money, a huge amount. In my work, I'm used to 
quite a lot of uh, decision making and activity and large numbers moving around. It's kind of a home game for me really, to be honest. So now that you know that people are outside their comfort zone, you have to try to predict whether they are going to be too tight or too loose, afraid or over eager. And if you could figure out which way they're going to err from their regular game, you could make some good decisions against them. It's going to take a lot of good decisions to work your way to the final table of this richest ever poker tournament with that 19 million pound first place prize hanging up there. And Queens didn't work so well for Sam Greenwood. It could have ended much worse. Here he is with two jacks, the opener, making it 9,500 to go, and Danny Tang with black threes. Well, it would have been a lot worse if anyone else had those queens, but Sam Greenwood, really, with a high class, world class, lay down on the turn with no overcard. Pretty impressive. This just isn't fair. This oh. isn't real life, is it? Unbelievable. Nikki P again with aces, while Greenwood has a big pocket pair. And Petrangelo three betting to 110,000. Well, this is a different situation. It's going to be more difficult for Greenwood to narrow his range, because this could be what's known as a squeeze spot where you're just re-raising out of the big blind, hoping to pick up the, the pot pre-flop. So he's not gonna have him as narrow as he did when you know Nick four bet, bet the flop and bet the turn. So interesting to see how that affects the action post-flop. Queen eight, seven, one over card to the two jacks out there after Greenwood called and Tang laid it down. So 235 in the middle and Nikki P will reach out and bet 60. It's about a quarter pot bet, which is pretty standard. Uh, it's a newer school uh, sizing that I think because of a lot of like computer work that's been done, realize that this is actually a pretty good sizing in this spot. And so obviously with jacks at that price, you're gonna definitely peel and see another card. And the queen pairing is a welcome sight for the two jacks. But unfortunately, Greenwood is cooked. I mean, if you're Petrangelo, you gotta worry a little bit about a hand like ace queen or king queen. Uh, you did get called on the flop, so Greenwood has something. Probably not just an ace high type hand, so it's either a pair or he, you know, like in the hole, like Jacks, or he actually flopped top pair. If so, he's going to hear from Greenwood and then be in a tough spot. As we know, it's just the Jacks. And it's a little bit too much, apparently, for Sam to lay down on this occasion on the turn. So he calls the 120, and now a 10 comes off on the river. Well, notice before, Greenwood was able, as I said, to get away on the turn with an overpair. In this case, without an overpair, uh, with Nick Petrangelo's range a little bit wider, you know, he's an aggressive player. That goes check, check on the river. Wow, so no value for Petrangelo. He likes to shut it down. 32-year-old, based up in Alberta, Canada, with over 17 million in career tournament earnings. He just plays aces. Seems like it, but you know, I've played with him before and I've seen hands other than aces. Thank you. I think I remember somewhere along the line him getting involved with less than aces. Not so that, far here today. He has a very aggressive oh, reputation, gosh. which is why that first laydown from Sam Greenwood was so incredible. Against a player like Nick Petrangelo, you pick up two queens, which is an overpair, you're usually going to get it in. And you get a look now at Makita Badziakuski with King Ten of Hearts up against Jungle Man Dan Cates, who's got the better hearts. Open to 10K out of Makita, known as Bads. Yeah, Jungle Man looks comfortable. Why wouldn't you? You got two elbows in the traps, <laughs> plenty of pressure. Oh, come this on. This is crazy. Do pros just get aces more often than the non-pros? Because I didn't see this happen uh, at their table. So obviously going to re-raise with the aces here from the button. Three betting to 41,000. Makita could go a few ways here. You know, the re-raise is coming from the button. You are against an accomplished player like Vogel saying. Uh, the price is relatively cheap, 30,000. You're playing deep. You have a hand that plays pretty well post-flop. I don't hate the call here. And the opportunity to close the action for Cates, but is this A6 suited worthy of another 31? I think A6 suited plays a lot worse than King 10 suited in this kind of situation. He just says, forget it, I don't want to deal with these two. So down to heads up, and the flush draw shows up right away for Makita, who checks it over to Vogel. Wow, interesting check back there with aces. Setting a little bit of a trap, also pot control, keeping the pot small. Not impossible for Bads to have binked a jack on the flop and 
by checking back. Vogel prevents the big check raise and Dilemma's moving forward. Now a queen on the turn and Bads with the open ender and the flush draw semi-bluffing 72k. Oh, this is a very big hand. Obviously flopping a flush draw is a big deal, but now the open ended straight draw as well. You've also got an opponent who didn't bet the flop. You know, he could have been on a steal with something, you know, weak like ace-three suited. It's a good opportunity to bet here. You know, you're going to call a bet anyway. You might as well take the lead and maybe win the pot if he folds. Wow, there it is, the straight. Bingo, nine of clubs, giving Bads the king high straight in an almost quarter million chip pot here. Well, about 250,000 in the middle. You might worry a little bit about clubs. There's obviously full houses possible. But if you're Makita, you got to like your hand and want value on this river. Question is, what's the bet size? And he bets 280. Over betting the pot and when players do that, Daniel, obviously there's some polarity and you begin to wonder, is my man bluffing or does he have it? Because there's not a lot in between. Yeah, but then, you know, you got aces, you got an over pair, the hearts missed, a lot of other hands could have missed. Pretty difficult to fold aces, um, you know, getting a price that you are, which is about two to one. You'd have to really know your opponent, know his range in this situation, the types of hands he would call a three bet, you know, bet the turn and then fire big on the river. So I think... Uh, Christophe's, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. Okay. Above the rim stuff. We are seeing some high level poker early on here at this pro table. You know, this is not easy to do here to fold aces. Incredible lay down. All smiles and camp bats. One of the cool mechanics that we are watching as well is that these pros have to survive against each other for six hours. And, you know, there was some talk, maybe they're going to play a little slower here and there, but I have to say, they're just battling out there. And in the end, they think, you know what, if some other, some other people might take a step back, I'm going to make a step forward because I want to get the chips after six hours to a point where I can use my stack and play against the rest of the field. Lex is absolutely right. Brings up a good point there. Yeah, I mean, you know, the question is, what do I want to do here? Do I want to go to war against, you know, the tougher competition, or should I just sit back on my stack and, you know, wait for a better spot? It seems like these guys are uh, are battling and making some incredibly high-level plays so far. No question about that. To be expected on the sharky side of the field. As Rui Cow seeing first action out of him, open to 12,000 with this ace deuce, picked up Jungle Man for the ride, who defended his big and flop bottom pair. Neither player has aces, so interesting. What, what do they do when they don't get aces right here? Well, just what we call the streets, you know, where you're defending your big blind, flopping little pairs, trying to get to the river relatively cheap. Picking up gut shot straight draws on the turn as it goes check, check. And jungle sixes will hold. Four to a straight out there now. Yeah, not not a great card for jungle. Like, he really doesn't beat a lot of hands if he's going to have to face a bet here. You know, 10 jack got there, a pair of nines, any seven. It looks like Rui Cao realizes his ace high is no good. So he's going to try to steal this one for 30,000. Rui Cao would de definitely bluff here. Rui Cao would definitely bluff here. <laughs> <laughs> She's so funny. <laughs> Who has more fun out there than Jungle? Oh, he's laughing at him. He's like, you're bluffing. I know it. God damn it. I want it, I want it so badly. Let me the time bank part. <laughs> Using a time bank is Jungle. <laughs> what the fuck you Rui Cow willing to give something away there a little bit with his mannerisms. Eh, he calls. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> no, I told you I'd disrespect you in other ways. Oh, boy. This guy's been such a welcome addition to the poker scene. Jungle oh, Man sorry, is a character. Well, so is Rui Cow, who gave him all he could there on the end to try to get him to muck. But instead, Jungle taking that one from the man who's got over 7.7 .7 million in career tournament earnings. Cow having finished runner-up in a couple of Triton events before winning the Triton main in Montenegro for 3.3 million earlier this year, his third final table of the series. Yeah. Queen 10 suited meanwhile for Bats, who makes it 12 to go up against a King 10 of hearts for Greenwood. You know, you could do all three things with this King 10 of hearts. You know, you could make an argument for folding, for calling, seeing a flop, or Greenwood, who's taking the aggressive approach with the three bet. Looking for a table for two, as I like to put it. Isolating the opener. You know, and the opener is under the gun. And that's important to note because typically, you know, top players, 
they're going to have a tighter range that opens from under the gun. Well, we saw Makita call with the, you know, King-10 suited. He's definitely going to call with the Queen-10 suited in this spot, and he's flopped the flush draw. He has indeed on the A7-4 board. Swinging a miss for Greenwood, though, who's bloated this one up to almost 90K pre. How will he proceed? A certain percentage of the time he's going to bet here, and it's, it's over 50, and it looks like Greenwood's going to try to represent the ace. It's not going to work, though. You're not going to get uh, Makita out. The question is, what does Makita do here? Call to see if he can catch the club or get aggressive, you know? Choosing to check raise to 90,000 is bads. Important lesson there for people watching, you know? It's great to try to flop these hands and make them, but sometimes you can win the pot just by taking an aggressive line and winning without hitting. Aggressive is certainly a fair way to describe Mikita Badziakuski. And is that Boris Becker with some uh, aggressive social media casting, <laughs> making his way up to the feature riser? Yeah, Boris Becker, one of many athletes turned poker aficionados. You know, when you have that competitive spirit as a professional athlete, poker translates really well. It gets the, the mental game juices flowing. Were you at the Aussie Millions the year that Andy Roddick? I was there. And Gus Hansen, and I think it was Mike Matisau got involved in some bet about whether or not Gus could return Andy's serve. Yeah, there's a lot of crossover for sure, especially in the tennis world. Many Matisau bucks were lost that evening. As we pick up the action here, interesting flop texture. Kate's middle set having flopped a 10 while Vogel has an open ender. He's also got the backdoor flush draw now. Notice Kate's just called from the big blind with 10s. It's important when you are, you know, in the big blind. If you're going to defend a hand like 6-4, you can't just raise with your good hands and call with your bad. You have to have some bad ones in there. And, and looks like Jungle Man here is looking to slow play, set the trap for Kristoff, who could bite. He does have an open end straight here, but just queen high. It looks like he's reaching for chips. And he's been big. Wow. Trying to continue to tell the tale that he's got a little something. Well, now if you're Jungle Man, you're hoping that your opponent has an overpair, maybe even a set of fours. You don't want to hear, see Jack Jack, yeah, but doesn't. you're not going to get away from this one here. He's going to raise. And given the texture on the board, now is the time to raise. Obviously, plenty of Broadway combinations sure. possible. The backdoor clubs don't want to get things complicated on the end. So, Well, Kristoff had eight outs, and he denied him that equity with the check raise. And Kristoff wishes he checked back now. Don't know that anyone is having more That's fun than Jungle Man so far point. in this you event. And you have King, it's like fucking <laughs> no, but I mean, you just called Colin. And well, based on the yeah, shirt, yeah, Petrangelo yeah, appears to be having yeah. fun. Look at that Probably festive ensemble. He looks fun. I don't know if he's having. It. Well, he is. Yeah, you know, he had the aces a couple times, so things are going well with 1.6 million in chips. Yeah, and two nines to boot as he opens to 12k. Folded around to Vogel's ace eight suited now. By the way, Daniel, no word yet on whether or not Vogel got the job, as he's clearly dressed for an interview. <laughs> Normally, we see Kristoff in the hoodie. It's great to see here the sort of attire, the rules behind it, um, you know, calling for uh, stepping it up a little bit. And uh, Kristoff has gone all the way with the tie as well. A little crooked, though, so as to give off the sense that I'm not just playing ABC. That he's a wild and crazy <laughs> <Exactly>. guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So three-way action to this flop. Interesting to note, typically, people are accustomed to seeing Vogel with a scarf or a hoodie of some sort. There are, however, stipulations very clearly written into the rules of the Triton series that don't allow players to employ hoodies or scarves. Sunglasses are allowed at the feature tables, though, to offset the lighting. Right. It can be bright under the lights. Notice here Nick Petrangelo checking back after being the preflop raiser against two blinds. Pot control decision. Danny Tang, who got involved, has now picked up a gut shot straight draw on the turn. And given he was in the big blind, he can more credibly bet this range against opponents who express disinterest on the flop. You would expect Danny Tang here. He does have a gut shot to bet here and hope that, you know, both players have missed and he can pick it up credibly with some sort of... Uh, you know, representation of a real hand. Nick doesn't believe him just yet. Going to keep him honest. Now the board pairs on the end. A six certainly not outside of Tang's range. Absolutely. 
you know, Tang knows here, I can't win this pot if I check. So let's fire a hefty bet at it and hope we can get Nick off some sort of ace high hand, like maybe Nick turned ace five of diamonds or something like that, that may fold. Well, the trouble is conversely, it could be Tang who's got the busted diamonds as the two nines don't beat a queen or a six, but they do beat the busted draws, which is exactly what Tang has. And he's been looked up here by Nikki P. This is fantastic poker. You guys are really getting a treat here. Looking at how he was checked back this flop with the intention of keeping the pot small so he didn't get blown off nines, and he's picked up a nice pot. Top shelf. So what happens when you stick Stephen Chidwick, David Peters, Jason Kuhn, Sam Trickett, and Bryn Kenny all at one table? Well, you're about to find out, and you won't be disappointed. Let's take a look at the infamous table of death. That is a fair way to characterize this collection of killers. Just get a look at the talent assembled around this hearth. Well, you throw out a million pound buy-in and you're gonna get the best of the best to find a way to get themselves into this tournament. And that's what you're seeing here at this table. This is a poker nightmare, Daniel. Trickett, Ibinger, Stephen Chidwick, Jason Kuhn, et al. Just incredible results and resumes all bashing each other and trick it with the ace king being three bet by Ibinger who's picked up ladies. How will Sam react? 160. Well, he's going to four bet. It's a reasonable play. You know, Matthias Ibinger, he's an aggressive player as well. He could be three betting with a far worse hand than that. So this is an opportunity to take the pot pre-flop. Problem is if your opponent shoves, which is exactly what Ibinger does. Uh-oh, now you're in a bit of a pickle as they say. Indeed, this is not what Trickett wanted to see. Ace-King is a drawing hand. Thing is, he's already put 160,000 in, has 574 behind. Tough to get away here. But best case scenario, he's up against another Ace-King or Jax. two Queens and Jacks, maybe, bottom end. Could be Jacks. Oh, wow. So that's interesting. Notice sometimes when you four bet Ace-King, you essentially turn it into a bluff if you fold to the five bet. Here with Sam Trickett. Sam, how does it feel to be at this uh, glorious table of death, should we call it? Yeah, I took the words out of my mouth, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's good. It's challenging. It's not ideal. It's obviously probably the worst table in the room. And there's lots of big pots that I've been involved in that I didn't really want to be involved in uh, at this yes. point. And I don't know if you know this, but there's a total of 157 million in live tournament winnings at that table. Uh, basically, you're all maniacs is what I'm saying. Yeah, there's a bunch of sickos on there, yeah. It's, uh, it's good fun. I like the challenge. I like playing against these guys. You know, I do like competing as well. That's why I love poker. So, you know, getting there with a tough player and competing. They bring out the best in you, so it's enjoyable as well. I mean, these are some of the biggest crushers. Uh, Jason Kuhn has won a lot of the tournaments here at the Tri-T Series. Now, what's really cool about this tournament is that you get some of the old school pros too, like Sam Trickett. And what I really like about watching a table like that is that everybody has a skill, but because there's old school and new school, you're gonna see a very interesting dynamic. Okay, so you... It's weird, like if you made a book checks fold, you would tell me immediately. If I what? Maybe fold so, an ace-king off. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, that is correct. It's funny hearing Sam Trickett as being old school, but he really, you know, he's a veteran in million-dollar buy-in <laughs> tournaments, famously coming it's second to Antonio Esfandiari in the first one-drop million-dollar buy-in ever. Bryn Kenny making it 14,000 to go with King-9 suited in rough shape against Michael Soiza's ace-king. We shot it up to 50,000 from the big blind. You know, that's not a very big three bet in terms of sizing when you're this deep. Uh, Kenny's going to call with a lot of hands here. King nine suited is definitely in the range that he would call. And jack six five is not connected well to Kenny's holding, though he does straddle the jack of hearts. Yeah, no trouble here for Kenny. He didn't flop anything to get him, you know, involved in this pot. But he's a sticky one, Daniel. Certainly sticky, he could try to represent some things with a call here and hope that maybe Soiza has ace-king or ace-queen and maybe he can take it away. Or you can be Bryn Kenny and say, I'm a baller, shot caller. Kenny's gonna Kenny, buddy. Eat some of that, 117,000. Serving up a big plate of, what do you got? Yeah, you know, this is interesting though, because like when you think about what is Bryn representing, pocket fives or pocket sixes, would he raise with a jack? No, well, tough though with Ace King. So good read from Bryn Kenny, uh, understanding the situation, the dynamic, and knowing that a raise here is going to commit his opponent, who's just not going to do it with Ace King. Gangster. 
Look now at Cowboy Dan Smith, who's in a good spot here against Fedor Holtz. Aces downing the 5-6 suited combo draw. The young man who won 32 and a half million in the span of four years before retiring or semi-retiring is out of there. Oh, wow, so many outs, man. Ugh. Dan Smith inheriting the Holtz Bucks as we swing it back over to our feature table where Stephen Chidwick has Jack 8 suited and is showing his creative side. Yeah, reasonable holding in late position. Certainly going to want to open there, push the envelope a little bit. <laughs> Trick it, ace jack. It's definitely a hand you're going to play. The question is, do you flat, see a flop, or do you want a three bet? Knowing that Chidwick opens pretty wide in this situation, you can obviously make a, an argument for three betting. But flatting isn't bad either. Yeah. Trickett's going to play it safe, out of position, doesn't want to bloat the pot just yet. It's going to bring Kenny along. For a min-raise, this is what you'll notice. Pros are going to defend their big blind. So if you are min-raising, understand that, you know, a guy like Bryn is going to want to see a flop, and he's going to make good decisions post-flop for sure. So Trickett dominates Chidwick, who in turn dominates Kenny, heading to the 7-4 tray all-club flop, which is all Chidwick. He has flopped the flush, but Trickett does have the nut flush redraw. And Kenny also is going to be involved here with a gut shot straight flush draw. I'll check this flop. Trickett does have the nut flush draw, but instead hits a jack on the turn. Well, this is big trouble for Trickett. He has the nut flush draw. He's also got top pair. He likes to check. Really interesting. Wow. Well, I mean, now Chidwick is going to have to bet. You know, he checked the flop, under repping his hand. He's going to want to bet here. What, what, what is happening in this hand? Nobody wants to bet, and they all have pretty decent spots where they could bet. Yeah, yeah. Now the pair on the board means that that jack-high flush is no longer as safe as it once was. It's pretty safe, considering the way the hand is played. You shouldn't worry for too sure. much about it. For yeah. sure. And if you're a trick it here, you're thinking, well, you know, I want to get some value here. I've got the best hand, high percentage of the time, with a jack. I have the ace of clubs, so nobody's going to raise me with the nut flush because they can't have that. Now, question, what is Bryn thinking about here? Creative player, look, he's not calling with eight high. Bryn is trying to represent strong and raises big. Wow. So all of a sudden, Chidwick went from feeling really good about this hand to slow playing himself into a tough decision. These are the perils of taking these sorts of lines as he checked back to close the action on two streets and his hand is so under rep that he decides he must call, and this call from Chidwick is just so strong, is it not, Daniel? Yeah, you know, it's a great call. Obviously, it's, you, you got to make this call. The question now for Sam Trickett is, can you call when it's been raised and called in front of you? You know, the jack's probably not good anymore. Bryn could easily have a hand like 7-4, seven, 7-3 seven, for a full house, jack-7 even. So for Sam here, you know, can find a way to possibly get away. But again, playing against high-level players, you never know. All in. What? Unbelievable! What is happening right now? I don't think anything's happened in this hand that I would have predicted. Unbelievable! Trickett deciding to turn his hand into a bluff. He's not doing this because he thinks his jack is good. And as strong as Chidwick flatting Kenny's raises, how much stronger is Trickett moving all in over the top of it? Absolutely. Now, if you're Chidwick, you have to ask yourself, well, whoa, this is a very, very strong play. Yeah. He's going to lay it down. This is going to get through. That was unbelievable for Trickett to recognize the situation. He blocked the jack which means it's unlikely that someone had jacks full so he could get it through. And he blocked the ace of clubs. Yeah, what is he representing? That was unbelievable. Incredible play from Trickett there that got through. Wow. Suited and connected is Jason Kuhn. And ready to dance. This like qualifies as so many people's favorite hand. Everyone loves themselves a 9-10 of spades. I'll take the 10 jack of spades. You can have the 9 okay, 10 of spades. You know, same idea. It's a little less reach with the 10 jack. Huh? Similar ballpark. So just a call from Ibinger. A lot of interference between these three holdings as Kurganov contemplates things out of the big with an 8 9 off. Yeah, he's really not thinking of anything because he's just always going to call. Once in a blue moon, maybe he gets frisky and re raises, but he's never folded. And how does he manage to hit top two pair with both an eight and a nine when two of those cards were already busy in the opposition's hands? Just like that. So Kuhn's got to feel good about having top pair here. 
Obviously going to continuation bet. Heibinger, he's flopped okay as well with second pair and an ace kicker. Well, Igor's got to love this spot. With so many draws there, I would imagine Igor doesn't want to let a card come off cheap. And this would be a good spot to put in a raise. Bet Nicole of 20,000 in front of him already. And in comes the check raise to 87,000. Yeah, and now if you're Kuhn, you look at that board and you think, okay, well, you know, Igor might be doing this with some sort of combo draw. Flush draw, gut shot, uh, could be just a bluff, but unlikely there. His hand's too strong to fold for 67,000 more. So we're going to see Kuhn almost surely call to see a turn card. Easy fold now for Ibinger with second pair. Yeah, no club out there for backdoor nut flush prospects as he leaves the boys heads up. Three of diamonds on the turn, puts another flush draw on the board. You know, we call that card a brick for the most part. I mean, obviously it brings backdoor diamonds, but that's uh, not a huge concern for Igor right now. He fires again, this time 175K. And again, Kuhn will call as another 350 slide into the middle, over 600K in the pot. And the deuce is not the most welcome sight for Kurganov. No, Kurganov's not going to like that card because now all of a sudden he loses to tens or better. Uh, it's going to be tough to extract check. value, so he decides to check. And Kuhn is happy to check back with top pair there. Um, he's going to no see the bad news. But the good news is he didn't have to pay off a river because uh, yes. Igor was a little bit worried about an overpair there. To be honest, when I heard how big this event was going to be, there was a little part of me that's like, oh no, am I still going to be number one on the all-time money list after this? You know, I've only had it for one year. But there are many people like Bryn Kenny or David Peters who could pass me either in this tournament or maybe through a small cash in this tournament. With 50 million pounds in the prize pool, um, if I end up winning it, I could end up as the all-time money winner, which uh, has always kind of been a goal of mine to someday reach. So that'd be you know, pretty exciting if I was able to do that. There's no doubt, there's no way that I'm not going to be number one. You know, I cashed for $25 million last year. It just felt like a dream. It felt completely unbelievable. Basically, at the start of the year, there were three huge tournaments scheduled, and I won all three of them. It would just be nice if this happens. Probably nobody will ever, like, touch it again. It'll just be, like, off to the races from there. Never really give anyone a chance again. Always play the biggest buy-ins. If I got first in this, that would make it so much harder for anyone else to pass me. But first things first. You've got to finish first, and that is a very difficult proposition for anyone in this field, given the amount of talent we have in there. And part of that talent includes true teller, Timofey Kuznetsov, who is open to 20K with the blinds at four and 8,000, sitting on Queen Jack off suit. Kenny, suited and connected, will defend. Certainly a hand you're happy to defend the blind with, a hand like six, seven of clubs. Turns into a gut shot straight draw on the 10-5 tray board. Checks it over to Timofey. Well, Timofey checks back with nothing here. Queen Jack giving himself a free card. And he picks up a hard draw on the turn. He does. Not a card that helped Kenny whatsoever. He's going to check again. Timofey forgot what he had. <laughs> I doubt it. Little look back and no improvement on the end for Kuznetsov, but same story for Kenny, who's yeah, got just seven high here. And that's not gonna win at showdown. Yeah, he's just got a bluff at it, because he could have anything, right? Kuznetsov's range is a little more limited. What, what's going on here? What is happening here? My goodness, a raise. A small raise, too. And Kenny's obviously <laughs> gonna fall with the seven high, so Kuznetsov bluffing with the best hand, but a good read of the situation that Kenny was trying to steal it. Meanwhile, Andrew Robel has ace-king, trip aces on an ace-10, 9-5 ace board with three hearts. Dan Smith with queen-jack was trying to bluff him, and he picked a tough customer. Yeah, and a tough hand to bluff. <laughs> Very strong from Robel. Many Smith bucks have been acquired in that pot. Meanwhile, Back over to one of our feature tables. Ah, there we go, the aces. You haven't seen those in a while. The aces have returned, and this time Michael Soiza will enjoy them. That's the difference. The pros play the aces. Might be premature to say enjoy them. We never know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
Couple of threes hitting the muck. Trick it with King Queen off suit, no hesitation. And Bryn Kenny, two tens, too much to fold. Well, it's a good lay down there from Trickett. You know, Trickett, he does have a little bit of an old school vibe as we touched on. He's been around, you know, doesn't play like, you know, quote unquote a robot, What's plays by game? feel, yeah. instinct. And uh, to fold King Queen, most players would have played that hand. Kenny with the tens. And an over pair on the 9 4 3 flop. Well, this is big trouble for Kenny. It's always a stack, it's only 330 odd thousand. Very reasonable to expect both players to get their chips in the middle. As much of a reputation Bryn has for being super aggressive, he also has really good instincts too. Well, I mean, yeah, any good player today you look at that's aggressive, they have texture, they have layers, they slow play in certain spots. Kenny calling the 18K C bet as the board pairs on the turn. 60,000. Now up to 60,000, the number out of Soiza. Yeah, this is a spot where Kenny could just decide to, to raise. Oh, well, he's slow playing. Yeah, I think he feels pretty strong that he has the best hand here, but uh, deciding to play it slow. I think soiza has got a bit of a snug table image, too. I think Kenny is just proceeding with some caution. Could be, could be. Now Soyz is sitting there with just a little over a pot size bet. You would imagine now is the time to just go ahead and stick it in, but he chooses a smaller size and just 150,000. But enough of it that we presume the rest will go in and we're not gonna be able to bluff our men. Actually now Brent I don't think is gonna raise. You know, there's not a lot of value in doing that. If Soyz is bluffing, he's not gonna call. This is Well, Brent's gonna see the bad news, but you know what? That's a spot where you notice that uh, Bryn oh saved himself 100,000 in chips by slow playing. Something in that neighborhood. Chip saved is a chip earned. And many chips earned there for the 29-year-old Malaysian who knows just what it takes to win a Triton event as he bested Sam Greenwood in a six max no limit 500K HKD event just earlier this year. Look at Steven Chidwick here in the cutoff with ace five suited. I think I know what's going to happen. <laughs> if you guessed raise, that would be correct. Absolutely, especially from that position. We saw him raise jack eight of clubs earlier, ace five of spades, even better. That jack eight of clubs flopped the flush and got bullied. He certainly did. Off of the hand by Sam Trickett, who was risking his tournament life. Meanwhile, ace seven six as Kuznetsov flops middle pair against top pair. After defending his big, both players checking and Kuznetsov binking Kings up on the turn. Unlucky there for Chidwick so far. He still has a lot of outs to improve. And Kuznetsov gonna protect his hand with a bet. Kings and sevens. You'd expect as played that Chidwick would call this turn to the river. Oh, and trip aces now for Chidwick as the two pair are counterfeited. Instant check from Kuznetsov. And a check back from Chidwick. So notice there he made three aces, but saw no value in betting here. Maybe concerned he might get check raised. Uh, this is what you see at the highest levels, a healthy respect for your opponent. And you know, not always value betting. Very interesting there and interesting here as well as ace king is run into bottom set. Martin Cabral. Way the best of it against Tan Juan. Three hundred and ninety-four K pot as we take the turn. A blank deuce. Cobral moving all in for his last four hundred and thirty-one K and not a good feeling for Tan Juan who makes the call and will be drawing dead. Yeah, never a good thing to be drawing dead to say the least. Big pot there for Martin Cabral, everyone's favorite player. When I first heard about Triton Millions in London, I was actually very excited. Um, I wanted to, like, I loved the million last year in Vegas, so I was really looking forward to playing this tournament. Especially knowing how it feels to, like, coming second in the million in Vegas. I was quite disappointed busting early. I rarely am, but, like, this time it was really about this special moment, like, it's a once, kind of once in a lifetime chance. Not sure what's going to happen in the future, but for now it is. 
Well, speaking of special moments, apparently, Daniel, you and I can head over to Fedor's new fashion lab and get custom tailored apparel. What, really? Yeah, I don't know. You think he'd comp us? Do they have scarves? I would imagine. They've got to have scarves. Yeah. Designer scarves. 18K to go, says Soiza with clean jack suited. Soiza actually was part of a rock band once upon a time called Ask Me Again, and Kuznetsov has certainly asked him a question as he is three bet to 65,000 with the Queen 10 off suit. This is a really accomplished player we're talking about here with Timofey Kuznetsov, one of the phenoms that came from the online poker world that rose to the highest stakes in the land. Been playing a lot of short deck too, has Kuznetsov. He plays it all, whether it's in Vegas, you know, overseas, he plays in the biggest games imaginable. Bobby's room fixture over at Bellagio in the highest cash games in Vegas. So this is an interesting situation where you notice like the aggressor has a better chance to win this pot. With the three bet, you know, when he continues, it's gonna be difficult for Soiza, despite having the best hand, to find a way to make it to the turn. Well, he's gonna call with a backdoor flush draw, maybe feels like the three straights got some value. It was a small bet and there he goes, he's turned the flush draw. So he's a check calling the Kuznetsov C bet with just the queen high, picking up a ton of equity on the turn, has the best hand and binks a jack for good measure. Well, Kuznetsov waved the white flag after getting called on the flop. Question now for Soiza, is this a spot where I'm better off betting and hoping for a call or checking and hoping to pick off a bluff? Looks like he wants to get some value and thinks that Kuznetsov may call him with a hand like ace high or maybe a hand like two sevens or sixes. Not gonna call with queen high, that's for sure. Question is, does Kuznetsov have another trick in mind? Well, he got away with it in a much smaller spot against <laughs> Kenny, but thinks better of it yeah. against Soiza. You can't go to the well too many times with that trick, especially at this level. Everyone knows what you're up to, so he smartly lays it down. And Michael trending in the right direction. Folded to Sam Trickett and around to bring Kenny, who does not play the Jack-10 off suit. Matthias Ivinger, who is dressed for pheasant hunting. <laughs> Bryn certainly has a lot of gears. You know, you, you've seen him play a hand like Jack-10 in that spot before, but he's a feel player, plays with flow. If he chooses, you know, to tighten it up right now to set up an image later, that's what he's going to do. Ivinger has a hand that plays pretty well post-flop, a 4-5 suited. It's a fun one. Easy to get away from, sure. not get into too much trouble and can be well disguised. He's gonna have position in this hand. Soiza looks like he's saying, let's kick it up here. And I like oh, this from Soiza, Daniel, given that he's shown down some winners. He's got some good table image. He's on a bit of a rush. Feeling the mojo a little bit. Yeah. You know, King Jack, certainly not a great hand. Oh. And when you get called out of position, sort of the onus a lot of the time is on you to flop a pair because your opponent, if they're you know, a high level player, they're gonna be what's called sticky and peel and put you in tough spots. Ivinger has outflopped the King Jack with middle pair on the 9-5 deuce rainbow board. Exactly kind of what the situation I was saying. So he's obviously gonna, you know, continuation bet. He's gonna get called. The question is, what do I do now if I don't hit a, you know, King or a Jack on the turn? Probably check, shut it down, and lose the pot. Well, time will tell as Ibinger does make the call as you predicted. On the turn, however, Soiza picks up some equity in the form of a queen, has a gut shot straight draw. Yeah, that might be a card he sees as worthwhile betting because now that he's picked up the additional outs, maybe he thinks Ibinger has a hand like two sevens or two sixes, or even the hand that he has, which is the four five suited. He's gonna represent here with added outs. This is a semi bluff if I ever saw one and it's gonna work. Wow, really, you know, good aggressive play there from Soiza to get Ibinger off the best hand. Gives yourself two ways to win when you play aggressively. They fold or you catch it. The atmosphere has been great. I think everyone's having a lot of fun. Um, they've done an amazing job with the set and everything. It's a really comfortable place to play. And uh, there's kind of a special feeling about the tournament. Obviously, it's the biggest tournament ever. And uh, yeah, I think everyone's having fun. Everyone's joking around a bit and uh, it's been fun. 
And it was a little more fun for that man on the left, Jason Kuhn, who navigated the table of death and has the overall chip lead. He and the rest of the field will be back next time when the Triton Million field merges in pursuit of that 19 million.